Let us pray. God, our Father, we're so grateful for Ronnie Stevens. A man with a special anointing, brilliant in the brains, powerful in the spirit. We give you thanks for him. God, I thank you that with all of his accomplishments, he is still one of the most humble men I've met. If you walked up on him outside, you would never know about his brilliance, about his achievements, about his accomplishments. But you would know about Jesus. So, Lord, we thank you for him today and we pray that as you expand his ministry to us, that you will open our eyes so that we can see clearly and open our hearts so that we can receive fully. Open our ears so that we can hear distinctly. Give him the anointing to reach us today is our prayer in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs> I love Chester so much. No one since my grandmother has overestimated me that much. And, um, I spent a whole year with a chemistry teacher who never discovered my brilliance. And um, it's, it's a hard thing to be over introduced because you got to come up here and try not to destroy the credibility of the person who introduced you. We're going to study a uh, hundred. Did I take you to breakfast a year ago? Okay. You're buying next time, right? Okay. Are you, do you live in Nashville? Do you live in Nashville? Okay. I, th I think I got a job for you down here every every Sunday until you leave. So talk talk to me about that, okay? Um, somebody's been after me to find a worship leader, so I think it might might mean some support for you. I was actually in Israel during the day on Entebbe, which hardly anybody remembers what that was. It was the bicentennial Fourth of July, America's 200th birthday. Time magazine called the raid on Entebbe Israel's bicentennial gift to the world. And I was, I was feeling sorry for myself because I'm thinking, here I am, thousands of miles away from my country on its 200th birthday. I probably won't be able to make the 300th birthday. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, it became the most fantastic day to be in Israel, an, an unbelievable day. And, um, you know, you, you live long enough, you, you outlive your, your capacity to brag because, I mean, my, I happened to be in Germany the day the wall fell. And. The nurse at my dermatologist was asking me the other day what the Berlin Wall was. I think, oh my goodness, has it come to this? You know, people, it's a new generation. They don't have the same frame of reference we do. It's an amazing thing. What I'd like to do today is I would like to track a, a thread in the Bible. And um, so we're, we're going to jump around a little bit. Nobody uh, gave me the right to decide what the highest thing and the best thing is, but that never uh, kept me from registering my opinion. In, in my opinion, the, the Mount Everest of the Old Testament is Genesis 22. Uh, there's no place in the Old Testament that combines more of the vital and dramatic realities that the Bible presents us with. I, it's, a, it's a picture of what God did it's the story, if you don't remember, of the sacrifice of Abraham or the, uh, of Isaac or the near sacrifice of Isaac. I used to pastor a, a little church in Munich, and we were about a 15-minute walk from something called the Alta Panacotec, the, the old picture gallery. And uh, the most dramatic room I've ever been in is in that museum because there are about um, 14 Rembrandts hanging in that room. And on one on one wall is the um, Rembrandt's rendering of the crucifixion. It's called the Raising of the Cross. And we know more about the way Rembrandt looked than any man in the 17th century because he was so fond of self-portraits. We have self-portraits of Rembrandt from the time he was a, a, a boy to the time that he was just before he died. He had flaming red hair. And the, the, 
the overwhelming thing about the raising of the cross is, and it's, it, he captures the moment when it's, the cross is about a 45 degree angle. As a matter of fact, about the, it's like the raising of flag on I, in Iwo Jima. It's about that same angle and that famous photograph. And, um, but there in the foreground, right at the foot of the cross, is uh, a young man with uh, a green painter's cap on and flaming red hair and the face of the artist. His way of saying, I did it. It was my fault. My, sin, my sins killed him. It's so dramatic. On the opposite wall, there are some renderings of Old Testament scenes, including the sacrifice of Isaac. Now, uh, you can't convincingly paint anyone who's unfallen, whether it's an unfallen creature like an angel or whether it's one of the persons of the Godhead, which is, of course, a violation of the, tenth, of the second commandment anyway. And so the, the, um, the, an, the, the angel doesn't work. What works is the startled expression on Abraham's face when the angel's reaching out. This is the moment. He, he paints the moment of the drop knife. The knife is suspended in the air. Uh, the angel is reaching out to stop his arm from going down. And there's a, there's a startled expression on his face. And then there's also uh, Isaac has his, ha his hands tied behind him. And one very powerful motif in the painting is the exposed white flesh of the boy's throat, just waiting for, for the knife. It's, it's incredible. Um, I think that's on the front of something I wrote. <laughs> just remembered that. Um, so, so, so I, I think, and I think, by the way, I, th I think the angel was the pre-incarnate Christ, but that's an another, not everybody agrees with, with that. But, um, so you got the pre-incarnate Christ, you've got Abraham finding out what it feels like to be God the Father. Yes, why did God do that to him? Well, there's several reasons, uh, but may maybe God wanted his servants to know what it felt like to be God. Because what God denied to Abraham, he went through with, didn't he? But I, I said all that to say that I think the K2 of the Old Testament, you know what K2 is, that's the second largest peak in the world. I think like 12 of the 14 largest peaks in the world are in Nepal. I don't know if you've ever been to Nepal. I have, and I thought that I'd be breathing pure, pristine Himalayan air. And uh, Kathmandu is the most polluted city I've ever been in. There are no pollution controls there. It's in a little bowl. And when they get a little inversion, it, it all, all the pollution gets trapped. And anyway, it was awful. But anyway, uh, I, I think that Exodus um, 33 is the K2 of the Old Testament. I think it's the second highest peak in the Old Testament. And in that passage, and this is where we begin our thread, um, Moses asks for something. All of a sudden, I don't know if he thought that he had caught God in a new, in a good mood, and this was the time that would be uh, propitious for him to uh, uh, say um, what he wants, tell him what he wants. This is Exodus 33, 17. The Lord said to Moses, I'll also do this thing which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Okay, the Lord is in a good mood. Now, this would be a good time. So then Moses says in verse 18, I pray you, show me your glory. Now, Moses had, had seen about as much of the glory of God as anybody had ever seen. Show me your glory. And then God says this, Exodus thirty-three nineteen. I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show compassion on whom I show compassion. Uh, by the way, that truth is a part of God's glory. If you take that away from God, you're robbing him of his glory. 
Uh, I was given an assignment day before yesterday. I was told what to preach on. Nobody asked me which, which uh, text to preach on. I don't have that prerogative anymore. I'm a, the oldest private in a little army over there at the corner of Winchester and Forest Hill. I ring, so I do what I try to do what I'm told. And um, but one of the verses was um, um, Romans eight thirty, which has the word predestination in it. And we're in a time of mourning and desolation in our church. And I, I knew that I wasn't given that text to start a fight about predestination. So I, I tried not to say too much about it, I, but I did, I probably went a little too far to talk about foreknowledge because it's a very common theme embraced by many wonderful, revered, um, greatly used Bible teachers, that what that means is that God looks down the corridors of time and sees what we're gonna do. And when he sees that we're gonna do the right thing, he predestinates us, and it, the verse couldn't possibly mean that. Couldn't possibly. Could, it doesn't come within a thousand miles of meaning that. It's actually the foreknowledge that's spoken of uh, in this passage in, in verse 17 when God says, For I have known you. Now, does that mean that God didn't know anybody else? Amos 3, 2 says, he says to Israel that I've known you among all the nations. Does that mean, does that, mean he didn't know anything about um, Egypt or the Philistines or the Chinese? Well, no, no, he knew everything about them. When, when it says that, a, that Adam knew his wife Eve, that didn't mean that he knew all about her. It meant that he knew her in an intimate covenant relationship physically. Well, God has known Israel in an intimate covenant relationship spiritually. And I think we would all admit that there's an elect nation, isn't there? Does it bother us that there's an elect nation? If it doesn't bother us that there's an elect nation. Why should it bother us that there are elect individuals? Because if all it means that God knew what we're going to do, so he blessed us, that means that predestination doesn't mean anything. It means that God is a spectator. Well, let me tell you something, friends. God isn't a spectator. God is a player. He's not a player. He's the player in our salvation. But the other thing I have to say about that, and this isn't even the topic, so forgive me for running with this, but it's kind of in the, this text. Um, why would you want salvation in your hands? You ever made a mistake? You ever done something that didn't work out in your best interest? Maybe financially, maybe relationally, maybe vocationally, maybe logistically, maybe in terms of convenience. You ever blown it? Are you fallible? Is God fallible? Has God ever made a mistake? Let me ask it a different way. Do you want salvation in the hands of your children or God? Do you, want, do you want your children to be in charge of their salvation by the decisions they make? Is that what you want? Would you prefer that over putting salvation in the hands of Jesus? Really? Would you? Because there's no higher reason for God to save us other than that it is his will. When we look for a reason that God saved us, we're looking for a principle that God has to bow to. Well, there is no appeal higher than God. And at this amazing moment when Moses asks to see God's glory, he says, I'll have compassion on him, I'll have compassion. Wow. What a thought and what a context. I'm not trying to start a fight. I, I am trying to, um, and far, far, far better Bible teachers than I would dispute that. But they're not here. You're stuck with me this morning. <laughs> now, here's what the Lord says. But, okay, here's what he's about to say. I'm not going to show you everything you want to see, but I'm going to show you something. That's basically what the answer is. He says, you cannot see my face. Now, God, uh, Moses asked to see God's glory and God said, you can't see my face. There's a connection there. I think there's a connection with the doctrine of God's sovereignty in whom he shows love to. I think there's a connection with glory in God's face. Uh, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Let me say something about the face of God. When we, it's, it's accurate to say that we are made in God's image. That image is marred, but it's still intact, according to James, even after the fall. 
And I, I've mentioned this before from up here. Uh, there are certain theological formula which are accurate going from left to right, but they're not accurate going from right to left. For instance, God is love. That's true, isn't it? Love is God. That's not true. So you can run it left to right, but you can't, you can't run it right to left. Okay, now, we are made in God's image. That's true. Left to right. Now go right to left and, and paraphrase it. God is like us. That's not true. God is not like us. So it's not that there is something in God that corresponds to our face. You don't say it that way. There's something in us that corresponds to God's face, albeit microscopically, albeit something totally different. Because we do say that God is a spirit, and we don't know all that that means. We can't forget that the spiritual is more real than the physical. See, we, because we operate in the physical realm, we, uh, the, whole, the spiritual realm is so wispy to us because we can't see it. But it's actually much more solid and it's everlasting, whereas the physical is passing away. Now, um, God is spiritual, but there, but there is something in God that, and God has the right to define himself and to describe himself that he calls a face, that he calls a finger, that he calls an arm, that he calls eyes. Okay. One of the first theological principles is that God has no parts. So I don't know how you square that, but all I know is this is what God says about himself. And we have to accept what God says about himself. So he says, you can't see my face and live. And by the way, there's a connection um, with God's face to the sun. I'll mention that in a, in a minute. One reason we're given the sun is to show us a physical picture of the reality of God's presence. Without the sun, there can be no life, but you can't get too close or it'll kill you. So you can't see my face and, and survive. If all you have is your physical apparatus, that's not survivable to see my face or to, or to approach me un, uninvited. Uh, but there's a place where you can stand. In the New Testament, there's a person that we can stand in. There's a place where you can stand. You shall stand there on the, on the rock. This is where Augustus' top lady, I think he died before he was 30 years old, got his inspiration for Rock of Ages. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back. See, he also says he has something like a back. Or we have something like the original back, okay? But my face shall not be seen. So God says, I'm not going to show you everything you want, but I'm going to show you something. I'm not going to show you my face, but I'm going to show you my backside. The backside of my glory. Don Carson calls it, the, he says that Moses saw the trailing afterglow of God. Uh, we've been asking a lot of questions at Harvest Church recently. I think one of the biggest things we have to trust God with is who goes first, who goes last, and who goes next. And we would love to overrule God on that. Speaking of things we don't remember, uh, some of you, I think, will remember the name Chet Bitterman. Uh, I, th I think it was 82, could have been 81. Chet Bitterman was a Wycliffe missionary in Columbia. He was captured by a terrorist group. He said he kissed his two daughters and his wife goodbye. And a few weeks later, uh, they shot him right in the sternum and dumped his corpse in an abandoned bus. Fidel Castro, who operated in the same area, uh, he died in his bed in his 90s. Now, God doesn't command us to understand. He commands us to believe and to trust. There's a difference. I can't, I, you know, I, I'm foolish enough to take a stab at that, 
But nobody knows why that order played out like that. Nobody really knows. I, if I took a stab at it, I'd say uh, God, God's mercy is so great that sometimes he just puts it off and puts it off and puts it off, withholding his wrath from his enemies. And God's grace is so great that sometimes he just won't delay to give his reward to his friends. And the young often die. We cannot deny God the right. We cannot insist that God only has the right to populate heaven with the elderly. We don't have that prerogative. That's a divine prerogative. And we will not wrest it from God's hand. We will not. Neither will we understand why he exercises the way he, that prerogative, the way he does while we're here. One day we will understand. And by the way, that's what happened with Job. Job had as much, you know, Job didn't lose one son. He lost lots of kids. The great theologian of the uh, Puritan Revolution, one of the most profoundest revolu uh, uh, theologians who ever lived, was a man called John Owen. John Owen was the vice chancellor of, of Oxford. He was really the chancellor of Oxford because I think Cromwell had the official title, but he didn't know anything about academics. John Owen buried 10 children. Whitfield only had one child, and he buried that child as an infant. Job had an experience of uh, profound sorrow, multiplied experiences, not because he needed to grow. He was, he was at position one in pleasing the Lord. He could have asked the Lord, well, why don't you work on the guy in eighth place? He could move up. I'm already at the top. It was because he was godly that he suffered. And he, he, he asked a lot of questions. Luther said, if we're ever going to make progress in this business of Christian living, we have to learn to crucify the question, why? Now, I don't really agree with Luther because I don't think Job crucified it. And I think, and I think that's impossible. But we do, if we're going to make progress in the Christian life, we do have to be satisfied with God's answer or his non-answer. We do have to be satisfied with that. We have to crucify a demand for an answer that satisfies us. And here's the amazing thing. You know, when God was justifying his ways before Job, he went off on this amazing explanation of how he managed the e ecosystem. And, and one thing he was saying is, listen, there are billions of creatures on this planet, and I take care of every one of them. I take care of every one of them. And, it's, and Jesus summed that up by saying, uh, you know what? Um, God cares about every sparrow, and you're worth a lot of sparrows. So relax. He notices you. He notes you. His plan for you is a good plan, even though it's probably going to have more suffering than you would have planned for yourself. But here's the thing. Even when he got an explanation from God... That's not what satisfied him. Here's what satisfies him. This is Job 42, 5. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see you. And I retract. I take it all back. We're good. I don't have any questions. We're good. On Sunday, a lady said to me, you know, when I, her husband died when her kids were young. And she said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why. I said, no, you're not. No, you're not. Jesus said, you know, Jesus says in the upper room, in that day, you will ask me no questions. I said, no, when you see him, you're going to say, we're good. <laughs> no problem. I'm satisfied. Now I get it because now I see him. Now I see him. Now, um, I would say two of the greatest um, I don't know what to call them, disappointments, maybe even tragedies of the Old Testament 
uh, had to do with this man Moses. Well, I won't, I won't call Exodus 33 a tragedy, but it, Moses asked for something and God said, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'll give you a little piece of it. But I, maybe one of the greatest tragedies of the Old Testament is that the man who led them out was not allowed to lead them in. And he climbed up on Mount Nebo. I don't know if you've ever done that in Jordan. I've done it. It's an amazing experience. What a vista. And um, he said, you can see it, but you can't cross over. Well, um, one of the things the Lord teaches us to do is to develop uh, an eternal perspective. You see, if this life is all there is, maybe we have a right to complain. We really wouldn't even then, but we certainly don't because this life is not all there is. And you see, um, what we got to do is we got to keep reading. We read to Matthew 17, which says, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, and he led them to a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Who saw the face? Moses. Where is Moses? He's in the promised land. You just got to keep reading. You just got to keep believing. You just got to keep trusting. You'll get there. You, you'll get something better than what you ask for. There's nothing that great about Israel topographically. It's not, you know, Eitzer Weitzman, he's dead now. He was deputy, a great general. He was deputy premier of Israel. When he got to San Diego, he looked around and he said, why couldn't God have led the children of Israel here? <laughs> why did he have to lead them to the only place in, in the Middle East with no oil? <laughs> Well, um, the special thing about the promised land is that the promised one would be there. And God de delayed Moses' entry until the promised one was there. So he could see the promised one in the promised land. And it's not, like, it's not like Moses wasn't enjoying the time in the interim either. It's not like he didn't enjoy being in the presence of, of God more than having to go disgorge seven heavily armed Canaanite kingdoms in battle. Now, here's a very intriguing thing. We've got two more passages we'll look at, and then we'll, then we'll be done. When you get to John 1, uh, which is, I think, the purest theology in the New Testament, at least, at least in the prologue, uh, John says an amazing thing. He, he gives, you know, Mark doesn't say anything about Advent. He didn't say anything about the birth of Christ. Matthew tells us about the Magi. He tells us about Joseph's perspective. He tells us about um, the slaughter of the innocents. He tells us about the, the flight to Egypt. Nobody else tells us about that. Then, of course, Luke tells us about a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. John only gives us one verse which summarizes the theological reality of the Incarnation. And that's John 1.14, where he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we, saw, and we saw what Moses wanted to see. We saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace, in truth. And he says something very unusual in verse 18. He says, no one has seen God at any time. Wow, really? Didn't Adam and Eve see God? I would think that Abraham saw God. I would think that um, Moses saw something uh, in the great hymn to the Theophany in Isaiah 6 in the, in the year that King Uzziah died. I saw somebody who couldn't die. 
in the year that my king fell off a throne, I saw another throne. I saw somebody who could never fall off a throne. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Now, how could John say no one has seen God at any time? And Isaiah could say, I saw the Lord. How, how do you square that? Well, we don't have time to develop this. We already hinted at it. I think he saw the pre-incarnate Christ. I think, I think that the visible God of the New Testament is God the second person. I also think that the visible God of the Old Testament is God the second person. And most of the time called the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. Not a created angel. That's different. Hebrews is emphatic about that. Jesus is not a creature. He's uncreated. The first Adam was created but not born. The second Adam was born but not created. So let me paraphrase this. I'll, I'll read it like it says. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. He has shown him. Let me, let me paraphrase that. I'm not a scholar. I have no right to paraphrase the Greek. But let me just take a, a stab at it. No one has seen God at any time except, of course, when they saw Jesus. Amen. Or, even more specific, no one has seen God at any time except when they saw God the second person. Amen. Now, uh, what is left to us? One of the great funeral passages is 2 Corinthians 4. That's the weight of glory passage to 2 Corinthians 4, 17. If you haven't read C.S. Lewis's sermon, The Weight of Glory, you can Google it. Better to go, go to Independent Press or Second Press Bookstore, maybe Christ Methodist Bookstore, and buy it. We should read that every year. And by the way, he preached the sermon at Great St. Mary the Virgin Church, Oxford, uh, two weeks before Hitler invaded Germany, excuse me, two weeks before Hitler invaded Russia. England was alone. All was lost. It was the end of Western civilization. All was lost. And basically what he was saying was, it's okay. It's okay. Kingdoms pass, but there's a kingdom that doesn't fade away. Glory awaits. And... Um, 2 Corinthians 4 is the passage that talks about how that we have this treasure in earth and earthen vessels so the surpassing glory would be of God and, and, and not of us. It's, it's a great thing to talk about when, when somebody dies. But there's um, We come to verse 5 and he says, We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For God who said, Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's ours today. We don't have to wait till we die. That's ours today. And that's something to aim at, to see by faith the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Now, We long for things that we don't have. And because we don't have them, we aim for them. Um, maybe a young girl longs to be married. Maybe a young man longs for a woman, not necessarily to marry her, but that's, that's what he thinks about all the time. Maybe older men long for money or financial security. Or we, we actually, we long for a way not to be dependent on God is what we long for. We want to have enough money that we don't have to be dependent on God. Isn't that true? Do you think God's going to be our partner in that quest? I don't think so. I don't, when he, he called a rich man out of Ur of the Chaldees and took him to a place where there was a famine. Think about that. Uh, what we really want 
is the face of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 1 says, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. This is imaginatively difficult, impossible for a man, but um, everything we would have wanted in marriage is going to be met in heaven. Um, it's rough for us guys because um, we're going to be a, br a bride. <laughs> I can't say that without laughing or rolling my eyes, but it's, it's a fact. But of course, it's not physical, it's spiritual. It's, it's spiritual. I did this once before and it made everybody nervous, but just wait till the end. I'm not going to embarrass us terribly. Uh, what, what's going to happen when we get to heaven? Well, there's going to be a wedding reception. It's going to be a wedding feast. What happens after a wedding feast? Well, there's a honeymoon. Well, what happens on a honeymoon? Don't worry. What happens on a honeymoon? There's the unveiling of a previously unseen glory. And there's a union with that glory perpetually. That's what awaits us. Not sexually, spiritually. Not physically, theologically. And guess what? It's better than the physical. Amen. Better. Far better than the physical. And everything we've wanted, everything we've longed for in the face of our children, the health of our children, the prosperity of our children, everything we've ever wanted in terms of our own security, our own um, stability, our own lack of danger or threat that we all clamor for, we will have when we behold the face of Christ Jesus. But the promise of 2 Corinthians 4, 6 is, is here now. And the great message of um, Lewis's great sermon on June 8th, 1941. By the way, Google says it's 1942. It's not. It's 1941. And that's very important in the timing of the war. Because America and Russia were not fighting against Germany when Lewis preached that sermon. Um, but the great point is, why do we clamor for these lesser things when God offers them, us himself? And his, and his own glory. The psalmist says, your face I will seek. Let's, let's make that our preoccupation, even our obsession. Um, and let's don't pity Christians who die. Let's envy them. Because they're beholding his face. Amen.